The Director General uh, RCMRD, partners, colleagues, good morning. Good morning again. <laughs> it's a bit chilly, uh, but we have to uh, be a bit vibrant because we've been given an opportunity to see where we are going in matters uh, at observation. And I want to, as we open, I would want to encourage you to take this moment to say hi to the person next to you and know the name. <laughs> If you can. <laughs> One of the reasons why we're here is so that we're able to network and create linkages. So if you're able to exchange cards or contacts, that will be most welcome. So uh, like has been indicated, my name is Charles Mongi at the Kenya Space Agency. The Kenya Space Agency, we have the mandate um, of coordinating promoting and um, regulating space activities at the country. We are not very old in the market. Uh, I believe we have a booth, and we encourage you to visit us at the booth uh, to learn more about the Kenya Space Agency. Uh, and for this session, as uh, Mr. Idude has indicated, we have three sessions. Uh, we will be looking at unmanned aircraft systems for improved decision making. Uh, we have a speaker. Uh, we have Hawkins Musili, GM for Harry Aviation as a speaker, uh, affiliated to K Kenya Airways. Then we have the second session, Earth Observation Services uh, for Resilience uh, Social Systems. The speaker is uh, uh, Lizel uh, Boschov, uh, Commercial Director, Head Aerospace. And then the third session, we'll have Earth Observation Information Processing. And the speaker is um, uh, Dr. Kohei Yamamoto, uh, the principal engineer, Pascal. So the reason why you're having these sessions is to shed more light in terms of what is happening within our space sector, or within the Earth Observation, the application, Earth Observation Application Center, and the different technologies that are there. Uh, and as indicated, because we're starting a bit late, we would want to encourage the presenters to uh, try to reduce their presentation to about 20 minutes so that again uh, we also get some time at the end where we'll have a common um, maybe reactions from the audience uh, if in case there is any clarification that the members would want to find out regarding that. So uh, I want to take this opportunity to welcome the first speaker. This first speaker again will be talking about unmanned aircraft system for improved uh, decision making. Uh, the speaker is um, Hawkins Mosili. Hawkins is um, an accomplished engineer and an innovation expert with over 10 years experience in managing projects and teams across various functions within the Kenya Airways uh, group. His vision perspective has earned him opportunities to work on prominent pro projects such as Fahari Aviation, the Emerging Technology Subsidiary of Kenya Airways PLC KQ, of which he is a founding member. I will invite him and he share more. Uh, so I want to invite him on stage and uh, could we welcome him with a clap as we warm up as well? We are going to focus today on uh, unmanned aircraft systems for improved decision making. And it really goes very well with the uh, theme trillion dollars of the yearly cost of poor quality data. That is in 2016. So if methods have not been improved and you extrapolate with what you're seeing right now in the economy, yeah, that cost could be very high. However, beyond the dollars and shillings, there's also time. And getting accurate data is both time consuming and relatively expensive. Data quality is a pervasive problem. Uh, poor quality data has the task to determine the correctness of the data coming from Department A, do their own bit, and if that data is inaccurate, you always end up with 
consequences of any errors that have leaked through. So meaning going back to redo work, that's duplicating the entire organization. Drone technology has demonstrated its pot potential as a cost-effective and accessible alternative to satellites and manned flight methods of remote sensing. Uh, I think that's what has been used for quite a while. And I think the advent of unmanned aircraft systems allows the industry or gives this industry a tool, an accessible tool that gives you accurate data. We have examples in agriculture, aerial surveys and mapping that show how data, how the, the drone technology has helped uh, give very accurate data. Now, as part of our keynote speech from uh, Fire Aviation, uh, we have uh, two more activities. The first, uh, we request our manager responsible for training to take us through one of the projects that shows the use of drones in improved decision making, that is making sure that the data is very accurate. And then, uh, as the moderator said, we'll have a demo at around 12.45, uh, we'll ask our operations manager to take us through that part. Uh, and then uh, later on we can take questions and discussion points. Welcome, Hazel. Thank you very much, Hawkins. We can go to the, yes. So as the presentation is pulling up, I can introduce myself. My name is Hazel Washira, and I am the head of training at Fahari Aviation. So I'm in charge of the training division as well. I support as an instructor. So I teach people how to fly drones. And if you want to know more about our training and other solutions that we have, we assist you at our booth, okay? So I will talk about one of the projects that we've done to support um, our industry, that is the aviation industry, just to detail how unmanned systems can be used for improved decision making. Okay. Right. So um, this presentation is co-authored by uh, my colleagues and myself. Um, these are our partners. Um, we were working in collaboration with uh, one of our biggest stakeholders, um, that is Boeing, Boeing Next. They've been supporting us on this project, and the project is sorry, an application of unmanned aircraft systems for aircraft structural inspections. Okay. Uh, as I mentioned, this project is a collaboration between Fahari Aviation, um, Kenya Airways, and Boeing on use of UAVs for aircraft inspections. And the aim of this test is to evaluate the benefits of using UAVs to reduce overall maintenance cost, save time, downtime, especially for our aircrafts. These are very expensive assets that are meant to stay in the air. Um, improve accuracy, analysis, and recording of aircraft structural defects in comparison to other traditional methods, which include getting an, uh, a technician up on a step or a scissor lift to go and inspect visually. Okay, so. All right, so this is uh, the picture on your left there is one of our 787 aircrafts. Now, imagine you've been told you need to inspect the crown of that aircraft, and you need to do it within a specified time, because when we plan for maintenance, um, we have a specific schedule, and there's a ground time that has been allo allocated for that inspection. So imagine you've been told that you need to conduct aerial uh, inspection on that aircraft, and you need to get up there, okay? So this task would require you to have certain tools and certain equipment, um, some which are not very, um, very cheap to find. So we use equipment such as what you see in the middle there, um, that is a scissor lift to get you up there. And what you see on your right, you can see a giraffe, yeah? And many other steps to be able to get you up there. So sometimes it takes a while to go 
get um, get this equipment and get a technician or an engineer up there. So it takes a while by the time you get all your logistics and everything set up. So we are trying to see is there a way that we can use aircraft drones to be able to assist us to do aircraft inspections. Okay. So this is a sample of a damage that uh, was on our 787. As you look at that damage, many of you may not be able to see it, right? But that specific damage is a damage that requires the aircraft to be grounded. Now, this damage is uh, on the aircraft door. And in normal occasions, when the aircraft is parked at the airport, it's not very usual to find air ground equipment to assist you to go up there and do inspections. It becomes a challenge, especially in the airport uh, field. So the objectives of this project were one, to compare the general visual inspection to drone flight inspection, assess time efficiencies, and assess accuracy and effectiveness of using drone technology. So we set up a team uh, together with Boeing and we sat down and we said we want to apply drones to inspect our aircrafts. Okay? So we went into a training session, as you can see there, uh, where we learned now how to map the aircraft uh, to be able to, uh, to inspect using drones. Then the second part entailed marking the aircraft. So as you can see, the aircraft um, as you normally see it flying, it's not normally marked. But you, when you use a drone, you have to mark it so that you know the position where you're flying. So we had to mark the whole aircraft fuselage so that as we are flying, we know it, when we take a picture, where that picture is. Okay, so that we are able to relate it once we get the images from the drone. So we had to make the aircraft to identify the UAS flight path, as you can see from the picture on your right. And then we conducted the test flight, um, flying the UAS as close as possible to the aircraft body. Now the aircraft that we picked was a very special aircraft. It's a very stable aircraft that enabled us to also fly uh, within the hangar. And then the last step was um, now an, uh, engaging in the, in the test flight um, inspection. So we carried inspection of the fuselage of the aircraft. We did uh, three, four, three main parts. We did inspection of the vertical stabilizer, the horizontal stabilizer, and the fuselage. Okay. Now, the idea was to compare between what a mechanic would see and what an independent mechanic would see if they're given images from a drone or from a UAV. Okay? And after comparing the results between a mechanic versus a UAV, we, had, um, we did uh, an analysis uh, for each particular um, area. So for the vertical stabilizer, we had a 44% correlation, meaning four out of five were not it were not captured by the mechanics. So we figured that this uh, might be as a result of height. On the horizontal stabilizer, we had a 71% correlation, uh, meaning two uh, were not captured by the mechanic. On the fuselage, we had a 29% correlation, meaning four out of five were not identified by the mechanic. And uh, on the wing, um, this was not accomplished because um, the camera uh, the drone camera angle was not able to, um, to, to, to get the perspective, means it, it cannot be able to get images up, okay, because of the orientation of the gimbal. The conclusions from this project, now, we concluded that UAS images provide more detail and accuracy to the structural defects, as you can see from the data, the correlation, we had, um, we had incidents, we had images where the mechanic was not able to identify um, the defects that the UAV was able to identify. And image capture can be stored for future reference, which is a very, very important tool, um, especially when you're dealing with data. 
Now, the opportunities from this project, um, one, uh, as I mentioned with the wing, we had a challenge because we're not able to orient the gimbal and take images. So one improved gimbal orientation to cover the lower body sections. Um, we also looked at, uh, we're also looking at um, automated flights. Um, this would remove the need of marking the aircraft because it's a very time consuming event where we have to physically go to the aircraft and mark all the stations of the aircraft. So if we are able to have automated flights, integrate um, the, the body stations for the aircraft into the design, then that would help in terms of flight planning. Then exploration of other sensors, such as thermal, especially when you're dealing with um, aircraft damage, structural inspections. Okay, um, so these are our collaborators and stakeholders. This project was uh, undertaken last year. Um, we are progressing the project. We did a second uh, project this year, and we're working, we're continuing to work with Boeing to be able to validate the use of aircraft systems um, for aircraft inspection. All right, um, I will invite my colleague Naima to take us through some of the solutions that we offer at Fahari Aviation um, that also will um, touch on the improved decision making importance. You, you might not be able to, unless if it's done quickly because we are running out of time. Yes, she'll just take five minutes and just talk about the, especially the drone demo. I'm sure you're all excited to hear about that. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Naima Shekhan. I lead the operations team within Fahari Aviation and also a founding member of the initiation of the project within Kenya Airways. I have a background in drone technology, particularly aerospace, started as, Kenya, as an engineer at Kenya Airways and now transitioned to develop emerging technologies uh, within Fahari Aviation. So to, keep, to move forward from what my colleagues have talked about, especially uh, from a Fahari Aviation perspective, as we aim to develop uh, sustainable solutions uh, within the emerging technologies, and our key focus right now has been in drone technology, as that is the emerging technology in Kenya at the moment since we got our regulations in April 2020. So to start off, um, to look at the key areas that we service, from the agriculture, the mapping, uh, monitoring and surveillance, inspections, conservation, photography. So when you look at the solutions that drones provide, you'll find that they're very versatile and the solutions are vast. So we can mention them and they can be more than 12 or even to an 24 or 30, um, but the key ones that we feel that will develop uh, much faster rapid, uh, rapidly and also improve uh, socioeconomic effects in Kenya would be on the agricultural perspective and also in the area of mapping and surveying. Um, moving on to other solutions, uh, the services we currently offer, we have from a training perspective, if you visit our booth today, you will see that we offer different courses, uh, different courses in training from your initiation of your pilot license. And also if you want to uh, convert your license, if you have a drone license from a different state, and even to enhance your, uh, your, 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 your skills when it comes to uh, flying a drone. And on the data processing and management perspective, this is where we look at the solutions that we provide or the applications we provide. The drone is just a tool to provide images, to carry a payload, um, to do various uh, aspects of what you want to do. And what you consider the payload is what you carry on the drone. So it is just a tool for you to have a solution to it. Is it data processing that you need to do? Is it data that you need to retrieve? So what we consider ourselves is providing an end-to-end -end solution. From the time you fly the drone to the time you deliver the data that is required to enhance um, efficiency. Um, on the consultancy perspective, it's based on the regulations, the Kenyan regulations. There's many standards that have been placed which are adapted from the technology, um, the aviation technology, especially manned aviation. So we as the experts in the manned side, uh, we understand the regulations, the Kenyan regulations placed, and we can support you to develop your own training organization or operating organization as per the regulations within Kenya. Um, on the distribution, distributorship and supply uh, aspect, 
We know that there are individuals who would want to utilize their own drones. And uh, if you want to purchase your own drone, uh, especially with the largest market in DJI products, you can reach out to us as well and we can offer you um, the importation uh, process and also um, registering your own drone and also bringing it into the country. So as I mentioned, just come to our booth after the breaks and uh, you can learn more about what Fahari Aviation does. So not to waste more time, um, I'll talk about more of what you're going to be doing today, which is the demonstration. Um, if you look at the slide that I have there, it's more of projects that we've conducted. Uh, from an agricultural perspective, which is on your, le on your right, on your left, then you have our KWS on conservation, the aircraft inspection. We have all Pajeta, where we've done also conservation in terms of counting the animals. Um, power generation uh, at Olkaria, uh, just doing a uh, structural inspection. We have uh, seeding at Kaptagat, and also, um, as you see, our former president uh, trying to fly a drone just like the ones you fly at weddings. And the main, the biggest news that has been out there for Fahari Aviation, which is introducing of flying taxis, which we call eVTOLs, electric vertical and uh, takeoff and, and landing uh, equipment. So we are this is in development, and we look to uh, enhance the technology by 2024 to bring it within to Kenya. So our demo for today, um, at 12.30, as has been mentioned, we'll be showcasing two of our key applications, as I mentioned, which is part of the theme of uh, this conference, from agricultural perspective and also from the mapping and surveying perspective. So from the agricultural side, we will, we will deploy um, a 30-liter drone, which actually is 30 liters if you're carrying a liquid, and 30 kilos if you're carrying, uh, let's say, pebbles of fertilizer or seeds. So with this drone, we actually fly almost uh, an acre in five minutes, and we actually complete spraying uh, across a, cert a, certain, a certain area. Um, you find that it is very quick and, and efficient for the people who apply uh, drone, te I mean drone technology in, uh, in, in agricultural perspective. So if you go back to the end-to-end -end solution, you find that with these type of drones and the way you can utilize them uh, when, the, when the GPS coordinates, you can actually focus directly towards where you want to apply your fertilizer or you actually want to seed and actually do it more efficiently than spreading it across a certain uh, area. And on the second one, we'll have our mapping drone. This is a fixed swing vertical and takeoff landing drone. Usually we utilize multi-rotors uh, for short areas of surveying, but if you want a large scape uh, of, uh, of surveying and you want to take images of a acres and acres of land, we have our mapping drone that we'll be showcasing today that does over 50 kilometers of communication range and can do almost two and a half hours of endurance. So if you're even mapping a forest, uh, this would be the best tool to do it. The almost 42 megapixel uh, uh, camera as well. Yes. All right. So um, I look forward to seeing you all there. We'll just be behind this tent um, and we won't take much of your time. And we'll look forward to seeing you there. We'll discuss more about what the drone is doing while we're there. Thank you. Thank you, Fahari. I, I apologize. Um, we had to rush them. And uh, we know it's exciting to hear more about drones. And again, that's the next frontier. And I see a lot of young people here. Those are opportunities that you need to have discussions and see how you could use that technology. And one important point that uh, I would take home is uh, the one that was shared on the importance of data and the opportunities that it presents. Uh, the whole value chain on data is quite elaborate. So again, a lot of applause to that team. Um, and visit them at the booth as, uh, when we have that session. Uh, the second session we're going to have is um, on other observation services for resilience uh, social system. And we have uh, Liesel um, uh, Boschel, I, I hope I am not uh, <laughs> butchering the name too much. Uh, she's the commercial director, head aerospace. I want to invite her and then she'll share more about what they're doing at head aerospace. Um, Karibu. A lot of applause and we welcome her. Good morning, everybody. Nice to see so many faces on a rainy day. 
looks like Cape Town weather today. Right, I am um, Lizelle Bosov. Um, I represent Head Aerospace in Paris and um, I am based in South Africa, in Cape Town. Um, our head office is in Beijing, where we have a thousand employees. And uh, head, I always like to say, sees itself as the bridge between Chinese satellite operators and the Western world. Um, there are so many operators and they, I always say they are producing satellites, mass producing satellites in China at the moment and launching every week. Um, so let me tell you, like my previous speaker said, um, we cannot afford to have bad data anymore. So let me tell you what HEAD is doing to give you very high quality data uh, faster than ever before. So, um, right. Okay. I'm quickly gonna I'm quickly gonna run through these um, satellites that we have at the moment. Eighty-six satellites in orbit, ready for commercial use. Two of which is 30 centimeter resolution satellites that just recently been launched. And we have another five 50 centimeter satellites. Um, and I would like to tell you also more about our daily vision satellite constellations where we have 41 satellites monitoring your sites anywhere in the world. Um, optical microspectral satellites, we have Nature Eye, we have stereo satellites, we have hyperspectral satellites, um, and then C band SAR satellites, X band and L band SAR satellites were recently launched. Um, our night vision satellites, taking images at night videos at night, those have also been launched. So whatever your application is, we have um, the satellite for you to task your areas. So um, in the last couple of months, we've really launched 30 satellites successfully. Um, and our aim is in 2025 to have 200 satellites. As a competitive advantage, HEAD has obviously optical radar, hyperspectral video, night image satellites. Um, we also have more 30 and 50 centimeter satellites in orbit than our um, competitors, as well as submeter optical. We have 67 satellites for monitoring uh, as opposed to planets 21. Um, and then of course we've got the SAR satellites. So uh, I want to go a little bit more into detail just in the, on the satellites to give you an idea. Um, the 30 centimeter satellites that's just been launched have your spectral range, pan, blue, green, red, and near infrared. Um, and quality like we haven't seen before in 30 centimeters. Right, our SuperView um, satellites is 50 centimeter resolution. We have four in the constellation. Um, daily monitoring by the four in the constellation. Um, an average of two million square kilometers um, per day gets task. So you can imagine we have got a very big archive globally available and I think for 2022, most areas have been 80% collected. I need to also tell you about our direct 
the receiving ground stations that we supply and I'm happy to see our colleagues from ST in Ethiopia also here this week. Um, we have recently in the last couple of years supplied Ethiopia um, Space Agency with a ground station um, including antenna system, data processing system, data application software and um, I'm happy to say due to the hard work of that team um, it looks like it's fully operational um, and uh, they are downloading uh, data and imagery at the ground station and distributing it to the ministries which is um, where I think all of our space agencies in Africa wants to be and wants to go. So reach out if you want to talk to us more about that and also about acquiring your own satellites. The Superview constellation of four um, has got a, a vast um, and very big archive um, as I said and um, I also want to mention the X-band two satellites were launched dual formation bringing you INSAR imagery and um, for for the Netherlands um, space office they have a data portal and um, we supply and task the whole of the Netherlands every month for them with Superview and the data is available on their portal. Excellent data that they use for you can see site preparation of a new roundabout and then when it's done. The Earth Scanner I would like to tell you about that is a very big satellite um, as you can see at the bottom of the screen it is 1,200 kilograms and it has a swath of 136 kilometers and we have three of those. The latest one was launched a couple of months ago. It has a swath of 150 kilometers and um, this satellite we use uh, for country coverages, uh, for instance in South America or very big countries um, where you use three earth scanners and in a couple of weeks you can have the whole country collected with 50 centimeter satellite imagery. Um, with that kind of swath uh, we've l recently captured two countries in one pass uh, with the earth scanner uh, that was um, Bahrain and uh, Qatar, 50 centimeter satellite imagery. It's a beautiful product. I've um, taken the liberty to have a look at Kenya. Um, we have 92% coverage of Kenya with the Earth scanner with 50 centimeter already uh, for the last two years. And if you can see the strips, uh, it will take about seven, seven strips to cover, to cover Kenya. So um, very possible for us to give you a country coverage three times a year, like what we're doing for South Africa now. Happy to say that our global 75 centimeter mosaic is coming online and should be ready for web services towards the end of the year. Beautiful data, the global base map 2021. There's Nairobi and it's very good quality. Also need to tell you about our automatic building footprint extraction from the earth scanner from 50 centimeter satellite imagery. Also a very nice product. Recently done it for um, the whole country of Lesotho. So uh, high revisit times. Every 15 minutes we can monitor your target, your site. So uh, I remember beginning of the year um, we could only monitor in the mornings from 9 o'clock till 12 o'clock every 15 minutes 
Um, but now, since last month, we've launched another 10 daily vision satellites for the constellation, uh, which is at uh, 63 satellites at the moment. When we finish, it will be at 138 satellites in 2025. Um, so at the moment now, we can monitor your site every 15 minutes from 9 a.m. in the morning until 5 p.m. in the afternoon. We've done a border, co um, border collection for Brazil, Paraguay a, a few months ago and with this uh, constellation and every 15 minutes we tasked um, and monitored the area like you can see there this is with one meter satellite imagery um, 928 we monitor tasked the first one and then 943 and then again at 959 1023 1434 and then 2152 night time and then a little bit later you can see there's less lights at uh, 2222 we also task so bringing me to the night vision imagery we can take supply you the images um, or the video 30 centi 30 seconds video at night um, for instance, Cape Town Port, um, we are busy helping them for um, disaster management and all kinds of um, monitoring that they need to do by video at night. Um, uh, I think it is the Departments of Science and Technologies in, um, in Africa that's very interested in this kind of data. Um, as they want to uh, attract investors for power projects into Africa. They use night vision to show how dark the villages in Africa is. Um, and we need more power in Africa. So they use night vision to show that. Right, and there's a uh, day vision, a day image with your night image combined. C-band radar constellation we have since um, 2016. Radar, as you know, uh, collecting through all sorts of weather conditions and also at night. Um, this is a night image showing multiple shipping vessels leaving the port. I'm very happy to introduce our new uh, SAR L-band um, imagery. This satellite was launched last month um, and as you know um, they can penetrate through trees, through the trees canopy and water um, and this is very good with helping to build your DTM as well. Um, this is your before and after calibration of the Alban. We have a stereo capacity stereo satellite called ZY3. ZY3 um, is capable of collecting panchromatic stereoscopic pairs covering the Earth seamlessly. Um, for 1 in 50,000 mapping, the stereo with GCPs gives you a positional accuracy of 10 meters and with GCPs to meet the elevation precision. A composite using stereo imagery with laser altimeter data, giving you a vertical accuracy of 5 meter with our GCP. Our Go Gaufen 7 satellite the elevation precision increased from five meters to one and a half meters. Stereo imaging with laser altimeter, vertical accuracy 1.2 meters without GCPs. Hyperspectral satellite um, with 166 bands 
and go from five, which is a high plus spectral satellite that's got 330 bands. We've got our five meter hyperscan satellite. And then HEAD has a Skywalker constellation system for space IoT services. We um, use an innovative approach, leveraging IoT and Earth observation combination, where, our, where we equip the ships with head terminals and um, providing tipping and queuing with VHR, fleet management and maritime. Thank you. That's it. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, let's give her another round of applause. So we've gotten data from space. We've gotten data from near space, if I can call the, the drones operating near space. So we're saying data is available or it's close to being available. Um, and then the challenge to the geospatial community is are we able to get insights from that data? Are we able to make decisions using that data? Because we're saying now it's available. Uh, how then do we convert that into decisions? So we move on to then uh, the last uh, but not least uh, presentation, the keynote address number three, where we'll be looking at earth observation information processing. Uh, we have a presenter who, or the speaker is Dr. Kohei Emamoto from PASCO Corporation, and I want to invite you uh, to make your presentation. Let's welcome him with the loud, uh, another round of applause. Thank you. Dear Chair Mangi. Director General and uh, distinguished guest and ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Yes, uh, today uh, I just would like to uh, share with you the EO satellite techniques. But uh, as I yesterday I mentioned, Pasco is a company to manufacture of wear. So we are capable of the how to use the geospatial data. So I'd like to share with you today uh, how to make it useful with the satellite data. But however, why uh, Pasco came here is to uh, introduce to you the JAXA, new uh, JAXA, uh, Japanese Spatial uh, Aeronautical Agency, uh, Space Agency's uh, new satellite Air 3. So let's move on. So uh, first three, I'd like to introduce Pasco and myself a little bit. <laughs> and I'm working Pasco 33 years, that is tremendously long. And the first, my first car career started as a GIS engineer. So I, uh, almost quarter century ago, I stayed in California, Esri. I stayed Esri one and a half year. And after then, I switched to the more overseas aid project guy, and uh, I do a JICA project. And five years ago, almost, uh, from uh, 2016 to 2017, I worked for the K KFS project, Karura Forest. <laughs> I love there. <laughs> and so, uh, get back to it, uh, right. So Pasco uh, is a company of the uh, surveying company and uh, the uh, net sales is, size is uh, uh, almost uh, 55 million US dollar size. Okay, I translated it. And uh, we put the uh, stock share Tokyo stock market first. And we have 2,700 employees around the world, but almost <laughs> shrink to the uh, South Asian part, but uh, used to be a worldwide operation we did. And 
Pascal's uh, three uh, key factors of, of priorities is remote sensing and on-site sensing. What on-site sensing means is uh, like a conventional surveying style. Yes, uh, I usually uh, doing the survey. Yeah, I'm a certific certificated surveyor in Japan, actually. So we do our surveying. Uh, and analysis technology is uh, like a AI and uh, image analysis and IoT and GIS. So we we do mix with these three technologies into the solving social issues, like a. Uh, natural land uh, conservation and disaster management and infrastructure management and so on. And I'd like to uh, precisely uh, explain uh, to the satellite, uh, our remote sensing sensors from satellite to the sea bottom vessels. So uh, we do a lot of aerial survey uh, actually and however, uh, recent two decades, we proceeded to the more satellite business area. So we do a satellite uh, data processing well. And uh, Pasco, your satellite business, I'd like to explain to you. Yes, we started uh, satellite business from a German X-band satellite, Terasa X. And, uh, we do our JAXA satellite business since uh, 2011, and that was the era of the very huge earthquake, East Japan earthquake damaged. But we are lucky, uh, we archived just before earthquake image with this Eros, uh, first generation of Eros, so that we are able to present to the government what is the uh, flood area. What is a tsunami damage area? Within the three days, we submit our analysis to the government. So uh, government recognized the powerfulness of the satellite data, uh, data analysis work. So now Japanese government put the money, uh, put the budget for the more of the satellite. And so uh, next generation uh, Air 2 is the uh, Banza like uh, Lisa san explained that the uh, L band is very suitable for the uh, to acquire the terrain model of the surface of the globe so so that uh, it compared to, I will explain to you later on and uh, other uh, satellite image we distribute again so what is the characteristic feature of the Pascal satellite business is uh, we can do from the top of the bottom. Like uh, we acquire the satellite image and we receive the image, we process it, but well, because we are the geospatial company, we process and analyze and to serve to the, our customers with the analysis part. So this is a uh, characteristic of Pasco's businesses. And pa so Pasco's business leads to the uh, every uh, SDGs aspect, like it's just the prevention and the land management and the infrastructure. Uh oh, sorry. And uh, environmental uh, conservation and like a economical uh, GIS analysis, like a logistic services and market planning and uh, like uh, the other overseas uh, aid project, like uh, at the KFS, we do the uh, run, uh, we're using with the Landsat data and spot data. So we provide, we analyze the difference of the, I mean, past and not, uh, present uh, with the forest, uh, forest conditions and to uh, create a database of that. And Let's move to the air loss of the JAXA satellite business. So, as I mentioned, like a uh, air loss first generation is uh, I mean, very popular for the African countries because uh, there are a lot of users of air loss. Uh, 2.5 meter ground resolution that was, but already terminated. And now currently working uh, satellite is a SAR satellite, uh, L band SAR satellite. So, uh, we have a lot of uh, orders for the SAR uh, observation for that. But 
uh, I put the right letter of the 2022, so uh, that is the current situation. So L3, uh, new optical satellite will come up six months later on. And L4 will be with success of the L2 uh, in the next year, and that will, will be the 2024. And so uh, PASCO are contracted with JAXA uh, as a uh, prime distributor of the L2 and L3. So uh, we are providing uh, this kind of data all around the world. So uh, this pic illust illust uh, explains to you what is the difference of the optical satellite and SAR satellite. Hey, look at that picture, please. Uh, so optical satellite cannot detect under the cloud. So interference with cloud is a very, very problem for that. However, on the other hand, radar image acquisition, that is, is a satellite, can penetrate through the tree top to the ground because of the wavelengths uh, can penetrate through the uh, tree cover of that. So, uh, like, because uh, radar, radar image is not the optical image, not visible image, that is invisible. However, it can be synthesized with uh, black and white images. So you can sense in the night time or the, like a uh, very cloudy or <laughs> this weather, weather, it can be sensed with the terrain, terrain conditions. So this is the I mean, uh, basics of the optical and light radar satellite. And Eros 2 is our now currently working satellite. So uh, yeah, the best resolution is one meter by uh, three meters. However, normally it was, uh, we have accept the orders uh, uh, up to the, uh, from the ultrafine to the scan cell width. And around uh, 2014, and the uh, time is 14 days. So I'd like to move to the mission, uh, ls 2 uh, com incomplete. So uh, this mission is a disaster mostly. However, there are various partners around the world. Uh, of the ls 2 users, so I'd like to introduce. So uh, this is a, a Chinese land deformation prediction project. So our partner uh, in Beijing uh, doing with uh, ls 2 satellite uh, with a monitoring purpose with their 100, 100 AOI area of interest of to be monitored with the disaster. So uh, Chinese company uh, doing um, a lot of businesses with this L2 round, round slide monitoring. And next, this is a uh, 3B geomatics that the Canadian companies, uh, what is, uh, they use, uh, uh, take advantage of the L2 L-band. They are the, uh, what they want to do is uh, to monitor the pipeline, but tree covered. So tree covered, under the tree cover, they, uh, they would like to uh, monitor the pipeline position and deformation. So they use mostly this uh, uh, L2 Elvan SAR, and uh, they, pro uh, they do a lot of projects with this pipeline analysis. And next is Astero. Astero is an American company, but uh, related with Israel company. And they find the water leak with the SAR satellite. Because uh, SAR satellite uh, can detect with uh, water, uh, water condition on the surface ground. Uh, sometimes uh, there are some of the applications of the, like locus. Lo uh, three years ago, uh, two, or th uh, two years ago, there are a problem phenomenon on the locus. But the locus uh, uh, put into the ground, uh, their eggs to the ground. So their uh, wet, wet ground is uh, some of the potential of the local uh, problem. But uh, in the India, they are very dry land, so locus, uh, locus has been stopped at the India at that time. So this kind of uh, uh, algorithm, uh, they use uh, detection of the water wet condition, and uh, they find a leak, water leak of the water pipelines. So they use the infrastructure management with this SARS satellite. And let's move to L3. 
So Air 3 would be new rearranged uh, with uh, the specification. I'd like to ask video to explain. Uh oh. Would you click the video? Uh, <laughs> touch on the video. Uh oh. Again. No. Quick video. No. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, no, no, this one, not this one. So I'm sorry. Uh, so uh, yeah, please uh, uh, stop at by our booth uh, because uh, we have the video explanation uh, that characteristics regarding to the Air 3. Uh oh. Yes, I skipped. L3. So what is the characteristic of new satellite uh, L3 is a very wide space. So uh, suppose that this 20 kilometer by 20 kilometer is a very high resolution satellite footprint and 10 kilometer by 10 kilometer footprint is uh, like a uh, constellation small satellite, 100 kilogram size. But L3 can cover 70 kilometer by 70 kilometer footprint. That is enough to cover the uh, boundary of the, to cover the municipality or the local government purposes. So uh, this very wide swath can realize that a very good weather condition up to acquire the whole the nation uh, cover with a very good satellite imagery. And so res resolution has uh, has been improved as from the uh, first generation of ELOs. So from the right hand side, GSD 30 meter is like a Landsat size, and GSD uh, 10 meter is a Sentinel uh, of free uh, satellite size. But uh, GSD 2.5 meter is five uh, first generation of the ELOs, but would be improved to the 80 centimeters. So yeah, it is hard to distinguish that, but uh, you can distinguish that the uh, power line can be distinguished with the 80 centimeter resolution. And a uh, new satellite uh, put with a coastal band and red edge band. And red edge band is suitable for the, to find out the health monitoring of the uh, plant uh, leaf conditions. And coastal band uh, can penetrate through the, uh, under the sea level, so it can be detected a cliff, uh, dangerous cliff area, more, uh, more than the RGB. And uh, what is the point of the L3 is a very high quality data because this is a very large size uh, uh, satellite. So the uh, attitude uh, control is, uh, uh, attitude and positioning control is very, very severe. So it can create a very good horizontal accuracy of the uh, image data. And that is good for to analyze uh, the AI technology, uh, with the AI technology, uh, later on I would like to introduce you. So, uh, PASCO uh, has a contract, yeah, JAXA, uh, Japanese Space Agency, owns the satellite, but we uh, develop the ground system, and we develop the, we process it, and we operate it, and we distribute it. This is the contract of PASCO. And please come to our website. And other things is, uh, yeah, what we do is uh, not only the distributing the satellite data, but also that we use it with uh, um, brand new, uh, most modern technologies of the with the AI. So there are a lot of satellite resources, not only the optical but also satellite. So we use uh, this as of the patient satellite data. Not <laughs> like a weather satellite, GNSS satellite. Like as of the nation satellite is below than the uh, uh, thousand kilometer away from the ground, but uh, the other GNSS or other is uh, ten thousand kilometer away from the ground. So very close. So, so EO satellite, uh, optical satellite is, uh, I, I mean, like a close to the visible, uh, visible ranges, visible, uh, visible wave range ranges. 
but the uh, radar satellite is uh, not visible range. However, it can be sensed uh, with the ground, uh, penetrated through the ground. So advantage of satellite data, like uh, Hawkinson uh, mentioned that, yes, precisely we need to uh, survey uh, with our, uh, UAV tools, string out with the UAV tools, but uh, wide image and uh, uh, like a uh, no flight rate restriction is the characteristic of uh, satellite data acquisition. So with a monitor with a uh, screening out with a satellite imagery and analysis, and we do the survey with a UAV or another conventional survey way on the site. This is the I mean, basics. And when it comes to AI, there are a lot of argument with uh, what is AI. So I'd like to define uh, the terminology like, a, like yes, deep learning is, uh, we call it mostly AI, and the models is a kind of the program of the result of the AI analysis, okay? And uh, what we uh, promote the AI things is uh, that uh, since uh, 2006, uh, we started the satellite business, and uh, recent decades, we uh, develop our AI skills more and more. And finally, we uh, come to awarded, uh, but not already. Or the four years ago, we have awarded that uh, classification accuracy of the building footprint. And uh, we at the Deep Globe uh, CV, CVRP18, we have been awarded first prize. What is the tips of the building dis uh, distinguish? Is that to classify with a low story, with a middle story, and high story. So it can be calculated out with uh, an estimate with the footprint. And we put the sum of the optical satellite imagery with the shadow lengths of the high story buildings. And on the other hand, like a uh, road detection, yeah, we can do with the road detection. So uh, right hand side is a, a ground truth image, but the uh, left hand side, that is the middle bottom, is a uh, result of the AI. So that is not so different from that. Uh, this road is a, like a uh, Indonesian Jakarta image. There are a lot of crowd area. However, almost 90% load are acquired. Yeah, this is a detail of that. So there, we can distinguish whether a change of the load, load development. I'm sorry. So I just would like to introduce you the uh, actual project in Japan. So uh, property taxation is a uh, most concern of the local government revenues in Japan. So uh, we, uh, we apply, uh, we offer uh, to the Yokohama city. B Yokohama is next to the Tokyo, very large size population. And uh, they do, uh, uh, they apply our AI uh, building detection with that. So this is a newly constructed building or demolished building. This is a problem for the I mean, tax, uh, tax matters for that. So we provide and submit with the AI result to the Yokohama city, and they do the correctly, so they reduce the error of the wrong taxation. Yes, they are really satisfied with uh, this result. And next is the population estimation. This is a, not a, a public service, like a, a commercial usage of the, like a, a Japanese commercial, like retail stores, like a 7-Eleven uh, or Family Mart, yeah, very small retailers, uh, would like to proceed to the Jakarta cities. And they, but they need a very good uh, statistics data. However, uh, statistics data in Indonesia is uh, quite old and the cycle is quite long. So we offered uh, that company uh, to uh, sharpen up the statistics result with a satellite AI uh, analysis result. And we create, uh, we distinguish the uh, stories of the buildings with uh, 
low, middle, high, and put uh, uh, some of the uh, uh, attribute of the uh, like estimated uh, resident number of that and <laughs> summarize with it. And uh, it would be the mostly 80%, however, 80%, uh, I mean, uh, precision. However, it can be useful for the commercial analysis usage. And next is the party field detection with the satellite imagery. So uh, if we put the training data, right, like uh, existing uh, GIS data of the uh, parcels of the of pad fields, and uh, it can be learned as a training data for the AI modelings. And after learning of the modelings, and we adapt to the another place to uh, extract the paddy feed area. So, yeah, it is really I mean, wor worry about if you you stand on the paddy in the dead middle of the paddy field, you lost at the way <laughs> because I'm dead. Yeah, I do the like a uh, GCP uh, ground control point mark on the paddy field, and uh, we, we easy to at the loss of the where position is. So. What I want to try to explain is uh, this kind of uh, extraction of the polygon is uh, automat should be automatically did. Uh, ten, 20 years ago, we manually did with the cost of the manpower, <laughs> but uh, it should be uh, this kind of uh, AI technology area. So this is another one. So that if we combine with the, this vector data, with uh, raster data, uh, which analyzes with directory with the satellite data, or the, like uh, Liz mentioned, uh, the daily or 15 minutes <laughs> monitoring, maybe we can apply with uh, uh, such kind of constellation data with uh, these kind of automatically extracted polygons. Okay. So, uh, like I mentioned, uh, yeah, we do a lot of uh, GIS and remote sensing. Uh, businesses around the world, but it leads to the SDGs every aspect. So summarize. So uh, uh, Pasco doing the SDGs uh, with their GS and remote sensing and AI technologies, and the Japanese new VHL, a very high resolution timing, uh, L3 will be launched soon, and satellite and AI solutions are viable. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Yamamoto. Uh, let's give him another round of applause. I know we are running a bit over time and uh, uh, we would want to move to the other sessions, but we wanted to get some feedback from uh, the participants who are here. Uh, we'll only allow for three questions, one question from this side, one question from this side, and one question from the other end. And I will request the team that is moving up the microphones to assist that. So uh, any question to any of the presenters from this direction, if your hand comes up first, I will pick you and then we'll move on. Uh, this section, there is no question, so we move to this section. Or were you not told there will be a question session? Uh, I see a question on the back there, so. There's a gentleman uh, back there, if you can get a microphone. Maybe you could be standing so that they see where you are. want to request that you also keep the questions uh, brief because you're running a bit of a time. Thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation. I would like to ask whether we have provisions for uh, those kind of data sets that we have been uh, seeing from the presentations. For 
research purposes or for student uh, package that we can make use of them uh, in our kind of uh, projects that we have in different uh, fields. Thank you. We'll take the next question uh, and then finally we can have another question on the other end and then they will respond as they make their final uh, comment. Morning everyone. I come from the water industry. I've seen so much information on satellite images. Now, we normally have a great challenge of non-revenue water. I've seen improvement to satellite, they can calculate a maybe after 8 to 15 years. So, uh, the only challenge that uh, water companies face in Kenya, it's no budget, no budget we normally have. So my question is, what are the cost implication of these images in terms of budget cost? Uh, how much does it cost? Thank you. Uh, so the question in terms of uh, the cost element. Uh, if we could have one question from any participant, there's a lady there. Maybe you could give your name and uh, the question. Um, hi, my name is Ruth. I just have a quick question for Ferrari uh, Aviation. I've realized you said that you have to uh, mark the aircraft to be able to uh, take it off. Uh, is there a solution for not having to mark the aircraft? Because I, I presume it takes time and a lot of manpower, which you're trying to avoid by taking the pictures. So what is the solution for geolocating, like where the picture is taken without having to mark the aircraft? Yeah, I think it's more also related to the ground control points that you use when you're mapping. So um, I'll give a minute or two to the, uh, to the presenters to uh, maybe you can stand and maybe face uh, so that we, on the interest okay, again. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, I think we'll keep engaging more. Uh, there's a booth there in where you can get more information. So uh, I'll start with a question on, I know you're mostly asking towards uh, satellite images, but you could still get uh, water resources using drones. I know there's a challenge for uh, coverage of the way the technology is improving and advancing. Uh, at Fari Aviation and other similar organization, you do have access to get images of our uh, land, uh, large areas, and it could talk towards maybe uh, reducing the high cost of satellite images. But to the point, the, the question from, for Fahari, exactly in terms of uh, mapping the aircraft to make sure you're able to get the exact location of what you're taking uh, or what you're expecting. So, what is currently in development, and I think my colleague Hazel alluded to the same is that we are developing with the help of Boeing and of course it's going through FA uh, approval, that's Federal, Federal uh, Aviation Administration, uh, is we are developing software particular to each kind of aircraft, which will allow the drone uh, to have automatic flight plans around various construction areas of the aircraft. So if you're expecting your fuselage, you have a flight plan for the fuselage the same would happen to our, our, our work is mostly with Boeing because that's the aircraft we fly. But I know the other industry players such as are putting effort in that regard as well. So that can eliminate what you've pointed out, which was uh, a, a point of improvement for a project because we did spend a lot of time marking the aircraft, grading it up so that we have exact location of damage. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, maybe we go to Dr. Morton and then we have one. Uh, and comment from this end. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to answer to the first question that uh, uh, for the uh, training and uh, learning purposes, uh, this kind of geospatial data should be uh, like used for, for the uh, learning, uh, through the e-learnings. So nowadays, uh, the cloud technologies would be adopted these kind of conditions. So what was inter what is interference of the data 
pro, uh, data business is the copyright. Copyright is a downloading and printing out. However, on the cloud, uh, there are no use of the uh, to download or print out in order to have the training how to analyze the data, how to analyze the issues, social issues. So uh, yeah, in the in this case, uh, Japanese government now preparing for the I mean, Japanese version of the e-learning cloud with the Japanese AR3. But later on, it comes up to the couple of years later, English version would come up and maybe another JAXA and JICA would cooperate together to uh, provide a specific uh, project for the e -learn uh, learners of the, this kind of uh, satellite image data. Is that the answer? Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we can have... Um Lisa? Yeah. Thanks. Um, the question about um, uh, for students and universities, yes, it's very important for us at Ed to invest back into our universities and students across Africa. And um, we have a division that will um, assist. So I think best is for you just to send us an email and we'll take it from there. But we do provide our students with data. Um, the other question was oh, for the, the, the monitoring, the cost. Yeah. Yes. So, yeah, look, I think um, the cost is coming down, especially um, nowadays with all the satellites we have and all the archive we have. Um, so for monitoring, monitoring purposes, depending really do you need it monitoring every month, two months, weekly, um, 15 minutes? It depends. Obviously, uh, the more frequent, the higher the cost will be. But uh, again, I think best is to send me your AOI. Uh, let the team work out the best way to monitor that site for you and within your budget. Thank you. Um, just to conclude, um, uh, the, I would say the key highlights from that discussion, uh, and, and that was mentioned by Lizzo, uh, and Old Hawkins and um, alluded to Yamamoto, is we cannot afford to have bad data. And from their presentations, we've been able to see that there is data available. And I just want to share a bit of insights around the data ecosystem. So currently, when you're looking at the value chain for our observation, we have data as a service, we have a platform as a service, we have analytics as a service, we have insights as a service, and application as a service. So when you look at the data, much of the presentation has focused on the data, the availability of that data, uh, whether it is from the drone or from the satellites. And then we get into the space where we look at the platform. And I can see Dr. Mubea here. There is the Digital Earth Africa platform. Uh, there is the Google Earth Engine. And again, that could also address some of the questions that was mentioned. Google Earth Engine platform, the Amazon Web Services, Esri platform as well. But again, now the challenge also now goes especially to the younger people and the people who want to set up business. And some of the examples were shown here in terms of how then do you analyze that data to provide useful information. And that's why we're looking at analytics as a, as a service. You may pro able to provide that insight from that data. And then there is the uh, insight again, which is essentially the actionable information that you'll be able to make or using that data to make decisions. There was a question about water. Are you able to develop a solution that him as a stakeholder within the water industry, you are able to address? And I believe part of the reason why we're having even the presentations here is to help you understand what are the areas that you'll be able to address as a person, as a company, or as, as an institution. Uh, and again, of course, there is also the element I mentioned, uh, application, essentially software as a system, where you could say, if uh, just for the example for water, are you able to provide a solution end to end that maybe queries data from um, uh, head, if there is that platform, or from Alos. Alos has been mentioned. 
And again, also one of the steps that we also working on as an agency is to try to create that ecosystem, that data ecosystem where you would be able to have, to make data more discoverable, especially from different governments. And again, another important element was mentioned by Dr. Yamamoto on the use of AI. And again, there is no reason why, again, I know our systems, we kind of focus on one particular discipline. Uh, we are encouraging the people in the geospatial industry to move towards the AI because again, that makes processes much more effective. So that again, as we move to provide solutions, we are also able to uh, advance in terms of technology and have spin-ins and spin-outs within the ecosystem. I again want to thank the very able presentations by the team from, uh, led by Hawkins from Fahari. Uh, the team, uh, uh, again, it's a one lady team from uh, Head Aerospace and, um, and Dr. Yamamoto and the team from Pasco. We want to encourage you to visit them at the booths, uh, those who have the booths, and then you will get more insights. Uh, we had to rush the program again because we started a bit late. Let's give them another loud of applause, please. And let us give yourselves give yourself a clap because you've been a wonderful audience. So we're going to move on to the next stage. I believe it's a health break, and then uh, we will convene later for the other session. I think data sharing, where you can access different forestry sectoral data and uh, share it amongst interested partners. So Officer is working towards covering this gap in these countries and also we are looking into fostering data sharing policies in country policies and a policy framework that is going to be regional. So another thing that officer is going to look into as well is the state of forest report where all these different countries will have an opportunity to state where their forests are currently and we are hoping that this will be able to foster and open up that portal for data sharing in the East and Southern region. Thank you. Thank you, Ivy. And I invite Michael Kimani Ngugi. Kimani Ngugi will be talking on behalf of Biopama, and it's a project which also funded by European Union and sponsoring part of this session. Welcome. Thank you, Sweta. Um, uh, my name is uh, Michael Ngugi Kimani. I work here at uh, Regional Center for Mapping of uh, Resources for Development. Yeah, one of the uh, part other partners that uh, is sponsoring this particular session is Biopama. Biopama in full means biodiversity on protected area management. Um, it deals with the management of uh, protected areas. So protected areas like, for example, national parks, wildlife, forest reserves. There is a, a booth for Biopama. If you want to know more about it, you can visit it. Uh, I would also say the Biopama project here at RCMRD is in charge of uh, managing and updating the protected planet. The protected planet is a comprehensive database of the world database on protected areas. So if you're looking for protected areas data for any part of the world, you can access it under the Biopama Regional Resource Hub. And uh, at RCMRD, we update the database for the 24 countries we cover, uh, from Sudan all the way down to South Africa. Thank you very much, and uh, I hope you have a good session. Thank you, sponsors. Now we are going to move to the presentations. We shall have eight minutes of presentation and five minutes of questions. We shall take uh, reactions after all the presentations, so kindly just note your questions that you might have so that we allow the presenters ample time to make their presentations and therefore we can interact with them. So we'll go with the first presenter, who is Hussein. Um, Hussein, will be pre Hussein Farah will be presenting on Earth Observation Based Protected Natural Parks monitoring and management. So if you are ready, then please welcome. Keep time, eight minutes. Uh, 
Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I will be presenting on behalf of Dr. Farah Hussein. And uh, um, my name is Robert Kimtai. I work for DRSRS, that is Directorate of Resource Service and Remote Sensing. And uh, I'm also part of the technical team that worked uh, on this project. Um, you can display the, the title of the project. I was part of this uh, technical team that worked on uh, Earth Observation um, Based Protected National Parks Monitoring and Assessment in East Africa. And um, next. Um, let me take this opportunity to uh, acknowledge the following um, others. I'll start with uh, Hussein Farah, uh, who is uh, a CEO for Front, Front Surveyors. I'll also acknowledge Eugene Kamale, Viola Oteno, and um, Kenneth Mwangi, all from uh, ICPAC. Um, it is also worth mentioning uh, that uh, this uh, project would not have been successful without uh, support from this organization. I'll start with uh, GMS and Africa, um, Africa uh, Union, ICPAC, Frontier Surveyors, uh, Uganda Wildlife Authority, UWA, um, Kenya, Kenya Wildlife Service, and uh, to some extension DRSRS. Uh, in case of any queries, clarification, remarks, you can contact me on that email, kimtax at, at gmail.com. Uh, these are my uh, presentation outline. I'll start by introducing the, uh, the, the project. I'll also talk of the main objectives that we have in the study. I'll also talk uh, about the methodology that was used. This is very critical. Uh, results also, the preliminary results that we got from this study. Uh, user manual development, it's also very important in this study. I'll also mention about it. Expected application, we need to see the application of our products. And also, I'll talk about the stakeholders and who are the users of this, pro uh, of this product. Um, uh, land use land cover mapping provide uh, information on a wide variety of natural resource uh, management. Uh, and also it provides a vital basis for the formulation of policies such as uh, landscape restoration, um, um, forest uh, tracking about uh, deforestation, and also uh, it provides information about um, uh, greenhouse gases emission because with this data we went up to 1990. With Landsat you can go up to 1973, but uh, with the interest of this project we went up to 1990, up to 2019. Um, and also for the interest of climate change, it was very important because, um, and especially with the UNFCCC reporting. Uh, this study focused on the three uh, countries, which includes Kenya, uh, Uganda, and Tanzania. And uh, we, gave, um, uh, we gave chance to these uh, respective countries to select uh, area of study because they are the one who knows where they have the data gaps. For example, in Kenya, we uh, got four sites from the Kenya Wildlife Service, which includes um, uh, uh, Mount Elgon, which actually transverses the two countries, that is Uganda and uh, uh, Kenya. Uh, we had uh, Kora National Park. Um, Savo West and Savo East, which is quite expansive. Actually, it's about uh, uh, 13,700 uh, square kilometers. Um, the main aim for, uh, okay, uh, for, for Uganda, we, we had also four sites, which includes uh, Queen Elizabeth, uh, Lake Mburo, which is in the western part of Uganda. Uh, we also had uh, uh, Kidepo National Park, which actually transverses between uh, uh, Sudan and the uh, north part of Uganda. Uh, the main aim of this project was to address uh, the challenges of inadequate capacity in developing these uh, land cover maps and land cover uh, change maps, because not every uh, country, not every uh, government department directorates and agencies can be able to generate these uh, kind of uh, maps and also land cover change maps in order to come up with decisions. 
because as you know, GIS comprises of um, quite a number of uh, uh, components. Uh, uh, for example, a hardware, you need to have uh, something like a, a, okay, lab, a laptop or a desktop. We also have a component of softwares. Do they really have that software to work on uh, uh, th those, um, maybe to, pro to come up with the data? Also, another thing is the, is the user. Do you have the skill to operate these machines? Do you have the skills to uh, interpret images and uh, those kind of things? And also, data is very important. It's part of the component. So uh, the main aim for uh, uh, this um, project was to come up with a technical user manual, a step-by-step -step user manual, right from the start of image acquisition, processing, analysis, up to the end you come up to the, uh, with the product. Uh, this study was undertaken uh, under the ICPAC GMES uh, uh, project. These were the facilitators. Because as you can see, it's quite a, an, a big uh, project which uh, required a lot of uh, resources. Um, so those are some of our products, uh, though I'll mention about them uh, in the next uh, slides. Uh, we have a map on showing the land cover, just the general land cover. And um, uh, the subsequent uh, uh, product is the, uh, the, the chart, which shows different kind of uh, land cover within uh, the study area. Um, these were the objectives of our study, uh, the assessment of um, status of selected um, uh, uh, national parks and forests. And uh, what we wanted to see from this uh, objective is just the status, what is, what, what is where, if it's grassland, where is it located, if it's forest, where is it located. Uh, production of land cover and land cover change and related indicators. Also, we wanted to see what are the, these changes between the initial year, which was 1990, to current year, which was 2019 by then. Uh, and the reason why we did up to 2019, we wanted to give chance to this um, respective governments or respective countries to work on their own using the uh, user manual that uh, we developed. Um, carrying out future prediction. Future prediction is very important in any study because this gives governments uh, time to plan in order to know where they will put the resources. Um, also uh, developing land use uh, uh, training user manual, a step-by-step -step user manual. This was very critical and actually it was uh, part of the uh, major uh, objectives. Uh, those pictures uh, were taken in Queen Elizabeth in Uganda, uh, which had um, a diverse biodiversity with both flora and fauna. Again, in terms of methodology, this study used uh, uh, 10 to 30 meters resolution optical imageries, uh, both from Landsat and uh, Sentinel. And, um, Sentinel, which had um, at least uh, uh, a temporal uh, resolution of six days revisit period and a spatial resolution of 10 meters, while um, Landsat uh, with a spatial re resolution of 30 meters and a temporal resolution of uh, 16 revisit days. The good thing with Landsat, you can be able to go up to 1970s, but uh, with the interest of this project, we just did from uh, 1990 up to 2019. Again, uh, something that wa was very was considered when uh, doing this methodology is the seasonality. We went for dry season imageries because you cannot intersect or you cannot compare an image which, which is of dry season and the one which is of wet season. So it has to be consistent to avoid uh, misclassification, spectral overlap, or spectral confusion. Also, another thing that was very important in our, our methodology was the the, the cloud cover. Uh, we selected uh, uh, imageries with a reasonable cloud cover of less than 10% to avoid also misclassification. Because when you have the shadow and the cloud, you can easily mix, misclassify the image. Um, IPCC, that is the inter, inter, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, uh, was used to map actually the nine, class, the nine classes, which includes uh, open, uh, open grassland, wooded grassland, open forest, which range from 15% to 45 uh, dense forest which range from f uh, above 45 and um, open water settlements and um, which are, and built up areas. Uh, open soft softwares was used to generate training samples. This includes the quantum GIS. It's an open software. You don't need to pay anything, any, no recurrent fee, no initial fee. It's just uh, free. 
Uh, then random forest um, decision tree was used to classify all these classes. Uh, after a rigorous um, suitability test, we realized that these uh, methods were suitable in terms of uh, applying with the, uh, with, the soft, uh, with the software which are free. Um, on the far left, uh, on the far end uh, is that uh, we need to appreciate the image. It's Landsat imagery. It's in force color composite. And the second map is the land cover that was generated out from that um, satellite imagery. Then uh, the last product is the land cover change, which was just a subtraction between the initial year and the final year uh, for us to see the statistics. Uh, results and up output. Um, uh, Mount Elgon uh, uh, Park was chosen, though we had uh, quite a number of um, uh, national parks within the three countries, but I selected this one for presentation. Um, we could display data in various formats, in table formats, in, um, in map form. For example, we have a series of uh, land cover maps ranging from uh, 1990 up to 2019. Also a table showing the same um, information. Uh, whereby you can be able to uh, display also in terms of statistics, graph trend lines, and so on. Uh, we also did uh, the prediction from um, up to 2050. Prediction is very important because it enables the government or any organization to, to, to plan. So um, from, from the forest, trend line shows a negative gradient. These gradients or these trend lines are very, are very important because it shows an indicator for any, maybe for conservation and also for rehabilitation purposes. So the forest on this case, which is uh, Mount Elgon National Park, showed a negative a gradient, which shows that the forest is reducing. And forest, forest is predicted to reduce by 65% in size by 2050, uh, with a reduction of 1,700 hectares per year. Um, as you can see, the cropland shows a positive gradient or a positive trend which um, shows an increase of 246 in area by 2050, uh, with an increase of 3,100 hectares per year. Uh, it is showed that uh, increasing size in area of cropland and reduction of forest can be related to increase of human uh, population. This could be as a result of anthropogenic factors or anthropogenic uh, influences. Again, uh, user manual was very important uh, because the main aim for this project was to come up with a user manual uh, uh, whereby a user can click um, a software and uh, get those results that I've just shown you below. Um, we, use, uh, we used uh, Google Earth Engine to get uh, some satellite imagery which includes Landsat uh, imagery and also Sentinel imagery which are free. Um, these are, th this software is very friendly because all you need is to just put up your credentials and log in. Uh, you need to come up with your, the accounts. Also, we, uh, we use Quantum GIS, which is absolutely free. No initial cost, no recurrent fee used to, the, to use this software. All you need is just to download. Although you, you, you need to check the, uh, the latest version because they keep upgrading. Another software that was used is the R Studio. This is uh, a free software which provides a graphical user interface for R and it's for statistical package. It does well with uh, image classification. Expected application, uh, we had data in different formats such as uh, uh, in, in charts, in statistics, in map forms that I've just shown you uh, in the previous slides. And uh, from those, uh, uh, maps, we could be able to see where are the changes and what is the number, what, how is it changing. So we tried to analyze this one in a knowledge management platform whereby in something like Abipsa we were able to see or to get the drivers, what are the drivers of this uh, change and also to come up with the responses. So who are the main collaborators in this stakeholder, in this um, uh, project? The main collaborators were the GMS Africa, ICPAC, also the government uh, institutions like Kenya Wildlife Service, the Uganda Wildlife Authority, and the uh, DRSRS. Uh, stakeholders were Uganda Wildlife Authority also, and the Kenya Wildlife Service and DRSRS. 
who are the users? The users were decision makers such as Uganda All Life Authority, Kenya All Life Service, DRSRS, planning and policy makers, learning institutions such as um, Makerere University. And actually I have to recognize Makerere University because they helped a lot on this in coming up with this uh, also user manual, critiquing the, the, the steps and also giving guidelines. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. Let me just confirm whether we have these other presenters before we decide whether to take questions or not. Moheli Mohapi, are you present? So we'll skip that. Frederick Mungai? No, and then... Stephen Mungo Macharia? Fine, so that means for this session we shall only have four presentations. Those were supposed to be presenters, but they're not in. That will give us really much more time to interact with the presenters. But we have announcements to make before we call the second presenter. Just a minute. Joachim Opondo from Calro. If you are in this room, kindly go to Biopama room, first floor in the RCMB complex. And Maximilian to see me from Uganda. Also, if you are in this plenary, kindly move to first floor RCMB complex in the Biopama room. Next presenter shall be Alexander Opicho. Please welcome for your presentation. Dear sponsors who sacrificed for the such wonderful program to take place, we say thank you very much. Fellow presenters, uh, colleagues, and friends, I say thank you for coming and I thank you for being able to be found at such a, a wonderful a wonderful place. Uh, I'm also seeing younger people, let, them, let me call them potential scholars or potential researchers. I send the word of congratulation to you. I want you to be encouraged. Keep on, uh, keep on feasting academic science uh, and research conferences wherever wherever they take place. Uh, this is the way forward. This is the heart of our future, especially the continent of Africa in particular, uh, the global south in general, and uh, the world of humanity in general as well. Uh, our brothers and sisters who don't come from Kenya, we say you are welcomed, feel at home, feel delighted, you are safe, and we are happy as well as we appreciate. We are extremely delighted to have you here. Welcome so much, Karibu Nisana. Hey, fellow Kenyans who speak Swahili, Hamjambo, Mambo, Mukaje, very good. My name is Alexander Opicho. Uh, my work is a lecturer a researcher, and a writer. 
Uh, my research is focused on ecological democracy. Now, uh, my document is not loading. I don't know what is the coincidence. Do I wait or I proceed? Technical, the technical department, the technical team, I say thank you for the work you are doing there. I think my document had a lot of information and they really shy of opening before the public. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, let me use what is in my memory. Uh, later on, when the document will open, you will get the published paper. Uh, you also get the drafts uh, subsequently if possible. Now, listen carefully, I'm stating uh, the topic or the title of my presentation. It is analysis of geospatial themes. Analysis of geospatial themes in African art, African poetry, and African prose by using a case, a case study of a regional center for mapping and resource development library, a library institution. It is found in Nairobi. It is found within the compound of a regional center for mapping and resource development. If this year you've not gone to any library, I officially welcome you to visit it. It is over the other side there. So you are highly welcomed. Uh, before I deal with the main issues, I'll begin with defining the basic terms which must have come to you for the first time. I will define the word geo, geospatial, geospatial. Geo, spatial. Geo means earth. Spatial from the word space means space. So geospatial literatures is a new model of literature, a new model of poetry, a new model of art, a new model of prose, a new model of drama, a new model of polyphonic genius, which deal with stories of environment, stories of climate, stories of the forest, stories of the moon, Jupiter, Mars, black holes, the, uh, fluctuating levels of the oceans, and any other type of stories that are related to the, to the dynamics of environment and how the Earth relates with other planets in the normal, in the normal and extra-normal universal system. Why this title, why this topic right now? Because the traditional literature had been focused on, a, had been focused on a, other stories, other stories that don't discuss climate as basic capital for human life. If you remember those days you were in school before, uh, the, the literature you read, thank you, the literature you read must have been about love, literature, political literature, uh, science fiction, crime, and others. But uh, our interest now, I know you come from science background, you come from GIS, you come from mathematics, you come from engineering. Now I'm officially bumpering you with uh, a break in monotony to inform you that uh, literature is also concerned with the earth and environment. 
So what I'm going to talk about is ecological literature, which we also call geospatial literature. So that is the, uh, the, the problem. That is the, the opening, the opening, the opening, um, the opening observation. This study was influenced and inspired by the, the work of Professor Sheikh Atta Diop, the late Professor Sheikh Atta Diop from Zinego. He is behind the ideas of Egyptology of humanity or Egyptian origin of human beings, Egyptology of Africa, or of African societies, uh, Egyptian origin of all Africans, Egyptology of the Japanese community, Japanese origin, I mean uh, Egyptian origin of the Japanese community, as well as uh, Egyptology of the European communities, or Egyptian origin of the European uh, communities. Sheikh Adadiop used geospatial approach to develop, uh, to gather out researches in, in that area of human evolution, abstract nature of the concept of the race, and other uh, theories he used to explain the modern accuracies in relation with evolution as a theory. So the first person to employ geospatial uh, science Geospatial Information System, GIS, to explain ecological phenomenon, to explain environmental phenomenon, and to explain human phenomenon like, uh, like evolution of human species, was Sheikh Andatiop. Comes from Senegal, he died in the year 1943. Now, since then, uh, scholarship in Africa has kept quiet. In the world of art and cultural studies, you don't come across Africans inspired to use poetry, to use art, to use literature, to use polyphonies. A polyphonic genius is a work of literature which is mixed up with a drama, a poetry, and a prose in one, in, one, in, one, in one text, in one volume. Now, the main problem of this study was to find to which extent has African scholars contributed using poetry, art, and literature to explain geospatial phenomenon. Other, hey, we can move, let's move ahead. Uh, just up a bit, go up, definition of terms. I have a few terms to, to define again before you continue. Because the word library is mentioned somewhere in the document, in my paper, in this paper, uh, a library is defined operationally as a, a, rev a revolutionary space, hosting information or a judgment of information for changing society towards better quality of life. That definition is not mine. It was first established by the Awas Patriotic Avas Avas Magazine 2021. The word Awas is an Indian word. You read W as W, so it's Avas Magazine. A geospatial consciousness, another word, difficult word to explain. It is human duty and commitment to protect qualitative capacity of the earth and its atmosphere to support human life. You and I, we are endowed with responsibility, both moral and uh, legal as well as human, to protect the earth, to give it capacity to protect each and every life. Animal life, plant life, uh, microorganismic micro life, as well as any other life that we don't know. Man has a moral duty. Man is the only a, a animal species that can possibly disturb, disturb capacity of the earth to protect life because of poverty of geospatial consciousness. Uh, another word, difficult word again to, to, to define is ecological democracy. The word ecological democracy was first used in the year 2021 by Professor Isa Shifchi, Professor Merita at the University of Dar es Salaam when he was holding the Mwalimu Julius Nyerere Lecture of the Year in Zenego again, hosted by the Council of uh, Development in Social, in Social Research and the Sciences, the most obvious, the most known called Syria. He argued that ecological democracy is a new form of democracy. People talk about democracies, like in Kenya we talk, you talk about democracy, you and I, you think about elections, 
and maybe rigging or not rigging an election. That is not a serious democracy. That is just but, uh, but, uh, but an insignificant issue. It does not matter a lot. What matters is ecological democracy, capacity of humanity to provide opportunity for each and every human being, for each and every other organism with life to enjoy capacity of the earth to support life. Now, ecological democracy has a two dimension, has vertical dimension and lateral dimension. Vertical dimension is where you are democratic enough to allow the earth to support life in the future. Lateral democracy means you are democratic enough, you are ecologically democratic enough to allow the earth to support life and to support life at your current time. That is what you are concerned with. Uh, as a baseline, you need geospatial consciousness or ecological democratic consciousness for you to perfect that. But you can't be geospatially conscious without having information. Uh, this information must come in a soft way, packaged in a manner likely to be communicated to any simple person. So the simplest way of communicating uh, geospatial information is community theatre, community art, simplest literature, Symbolist drama and any other polyphony. The geospatial information published in scientific journals, Journal of Geography, Journal of Earth Engineering, Journal of Metrology, Journal of Ethnography, cannot be read and be understood by a common person. But a common person is a victim of geospatial dynamics. That is why we need to demystify a geospatial intellectuality into a more consumable, consumable model. Consumable form by packaging it a way that it can be consumed by a child and a child, any school girl or any school boy that has not gone beyond the class five or grade five of learning. A geospatial literature is the last word to define. Is a new model of literature which I encourage you, if you have got a, your degree in GIAs, you've got your masters in art science, you can do your PhD in, 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 in geospatial literature. It is now developing at Makerere University. There are very many in South African universities. There are very many in Japan. There are very many in USA and in UK. I hope Kenya will take, will, will benchmark and uh, a change from this literature of love, literature of crime, literature of ethnicity to literature of geospatial consciousness. Okay. Move forward. The objectives of the paper were as follows to find the extent of your spatial consciousness, as you are seeing, to find the extent of trauma, as you are seeing, to find the extent of prose, as you are seeing, to find the extent of other polyphonic genius, as, as you are seeing. But remember, we've not gone anywhere. We are using the region center uh, 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 for mapping and resource development library in Nairobi. It's across over there. When you visit there, you don't go to another shelf. Go to, go to shelf J and a shelf H. I'm not a librarian, I'm a researcher on ecological democracy, kindly. We can move forward. What? Uh, the conceptual, uh, the, the theoretical framework, which I won't dwell there for a longer time, is quite simple. It was first guided by, by Professor, part of Professor Alois, Alois Schumbetter. But now the name Alois, you don't pronounce it Alois, it is a it is an Austrian word, you pronounce it Alwa, Alwa Schumbetter. Professor Alwa Schumbetter, he is the brain child behind uh, this argument. He argues that culture influences consciousness, and the consciousness influences culture. So as much as you are doing science research in those complicated laboratories, we saw the drone flying there in the late morning. Is it part of our cultural consciousness? Do we see it as part of us? How do we domesticate the drone technology to be part of African culture? How do we uh, domesticate the duty to protect the earth to come from Tokyo summits, COP27 summits going to come in Egypt in November, uh, other protocols to become part of African culture? I want to confirm to the audience, within our African cultures, we've not sensitized ecological democracy and ecological responsibility. Uh, just without wasting another time, uh, the, another theoretical support for the study was borrowed from uh, the late Ren Welleck. So Welleck is spelled W-E-L-E-K. 
It is uh, again a German name. You don't read it Welek, it is Velek. So to the argument of Ren Welek, I argues that uh, literature as a space, literature as a, as a socialization is also part of human culture. So human culture is literature, literature is human culture. What you want to achieve, don't just focus on the workshops and the labs alone. Focus on how to communicate it. Focus on how to aggregate that thing to become part of human culture. The way the politicians in the previous uh, era of capitalism and communism used culture to aggregate communist 